Again, thank you for joining us this evening. You're now attending the webinar entitled The Myth of Dark Ages, Teaching a Knowable Medieval Europe with Dr. Matthew Gabriel, Professor of Medieval Studies, Virginia Tech. I also want to note that we're joined tonight by Antonio Alberga Parisi of Forsyth Central High School, Cumming, Georgia. She's a member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council who will serve as our TA for tonight's session. Antonio will, will be active in the chat, sharing thoughts and resources and asking questions. And again, Antonia, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. Matthew Gabriel is a professor of medieval studies and chair of the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech. His research and teaching focus on religion, violence, nostalgia, and apocalypse in various combinations, whether manifested in the European Middle Ages or modern world. This includes events and ideas such as the Crusades, the so-called terrors of the year 1000, and medieval religious and political life more generally. He also has presented and published on modern medievalism, such as recent white supremacy appropriations of the Middle Ages and pop culture phenomenon like the HBO show Game of Thrones and video games. Gabriel has published numerous academic articles and several books, including his first book, An Empire of Memory, The Legend of Charlemagne, The Franks in Jerusalem Before the First Crusade, which received the Southeastern Medieval Association's best first book in 2013. He's also presented at dozens of national international conferences and has given talks at Harvard, Princeton, Georgetown, University of California, Berkeley, University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Virginia, University of Minnesota, University of Tennessee-Knoxville, University of Kent and Nottingham Trent University. In 2010, he was also visiting researcher at Westfalisch Wilhelms Universität Münster. And from 2016 to 19, he was an elected counselor of the Medieval Academy of America. His public writing has appeared in such places as the Washington Post, Time, Forbes, and the Daily Beast. Interviews with him have aired locally, nationally, and internationally. He was also a columnist at both Forbes and Smithsonian Magazine. And without further ado, I introduce to you all Dr. Matthew Gabriel. Dr. Gabriel, we're honored to have you with us tonight and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, really excited to be able to to talk to everybody here. Um, you know, it, it's it's really especially a privilege to be here speaking with my uh, my fellow educators. Uh, and this venue is especially meaningful to me because my mom taught um, sixth and eighth grade history in upstate New York for most of her career, though she um, retired just a little while ago. And she taught American history. So so my rebellion, I guess, was to move to the European Middle Ages after a brief uh, flirtation with archaeology, I, I'll admit, in college. Anyway, um, but her own, I guess, I guess my mom's uh, sweet revenge, parental revenge, has been meted out on me and my fellow medievalists lately as American nostalgia for medieval Europe has roared into focus over the last five to seven years. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, very clear forms of appropriation of the medieval by the far right. Uh, evocations of the Crusades and horrific modern violence against Muslims, Jews, and so-called secularists erupted into view with Anders Breivik in Norway in 2011, but were seen elsewhere in Europe as an argument against the supposed invasion of refugees fleeing the Syrian civil war, also in 2011-2012, but then percolated in right-wing online forums, especially in Russia, but throughout Europe and um, uh, in the Americas as well, but then sprang, sprang back to attention um, with the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville in 2017, and even made its appearance at the January 6th insurrection just last year in 2021. Um, we could also talk, and we should talk, about the problems of fandom in the European Middle Ages, how the supposed quote-unquote real history of the period is marshaled to do all sorts of racism. Uh, bad faith arguments have been made in some quarters about the two new hit fantasy uh, TV series, House of the Dragon, as one, the prequel to the books by George R. R. Martin and the HBO show Game of Thrones, um, and especially The Rings of Power, a prequel to the Lord of the Rings movies, which were, of course, based on the books by J.R.R. Tolkien. How could you possibly have black elves or black dwarves, they ask? It's not historically accurate, they say, leaving aside the fact that there's dragons and orcs and magic, of course. 
But then if pressed, these critics would say that at least, you know, these, these representations aren't true to Martin's and Tolkien's fantasy world, which are both indisputably inspired by medieval Europe. What these assumptions, what these critiques presuppose, of course, is that Europe from the 4th to the 16th centuries, or thereabouts, the edges of the Middle Ages, the European Middle Ages are a little bit rough, was a space only for white people. But this would have been news to uh, medieval Europeans themselves. We could and should talk, for example, about the archaeological evidence of people of African descent who lived in the north of England as early as the 7th century, of the abbot of St. Augustine's in Canterbury in the, uh, the region of Kent in England from that period who is described as being, according to a contemporary source, quote, a man from the people of Africa and who attracted students from across the island to study with him. On your screen now, you also see another example, a 13th century statue of St. Morris from Magdeburg Cathedral in modern Germany. Magdeburg was a very important imperial church favored by the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, and Morris was one of the empire's patron saints. We could also talk about the research by scholars like Dr. Verena Krebs, who's shown how the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia in the 14th and 15th centuries sent emissaries to Rome and throughout many Euro and traveled throughout many European kingdoms to collect curiosities. Our expectations of center and periphery when we talk about these things are here reversed, with actually the Europeans desperate for Ethiopic technology, wealth, and military support, and the Ethiopians curious about their backwards religious cousins to the north. And if you'll permit me one more example before we get to kind of the meat of the talk, maybe my mom's final revenge, let me return to high school and some examples from K-12 educational standards that state governments are pushing. And this one comes from my home state of Virginia and actually just from um, this past month, October, November, 2022. What happened in a nutshell is that uh, the current uh, uh, governor's administration, uh, Glenn Youngkin released a document that severely pared down state standards for history and social studies in, in the Commonwealth in Virginia. Every seven years, the Virginia Board of Education revisits the standards of learning. And in preparation, under the previous governor, for, uh, Governor Northam, the board began its work, and the initial draft standard for history and social studies they produced was lauded by the American Historical Association, among others for the thorough and thoughtful work that it did in producing the document, working directly with historians, parents, museums, and other cultural institutions. But then quite suddenly the standards were changed unilaterally by a new governor. As these relate to medieval Europe, which is taught in Virginia in ninth grade under world history, uh, the Northam revisions, and I'll say Northam and Youngkin revisions just for, for clarity's sake, uh, the Northam revisions make use of some of the best recent scholarship emphasizing continuity and change over destruction and disruption. They all have learning outcomes, uh, that, sorry, the Northern Revisions have learning outcomes related to Byzantium as a continuator of Rome, as it indeed was being the Eastern half of the Roman Empire that survived until at least 1453 CE, but also on the rise and spread of Christianity, emphasizing as it should, as scholars do um, today, the varieties of religious experience between East and West and between Judaism and Christianity during those first centuries. In other words, they emphasize there is, there is no real fall of Rome here, but an emphasis on transition and change, a recognition that something different emerges over time, but without the pejorative of something being lost in a fall. But the Yunkin standards collapse all of this, emphasizing the value of empire and suggesting that lax authoritarianism and corrupt Christianity caused Rome's downfall. This isn't actually modern scholarship, but it's early modern scholarship that the Yunkin standards are reproducing. These standards, in fact, could have been written by Edward Gibbon in the 18th century. Gibbon wrote his monumental history of the fall of Rome because he was worried about history repeating with his own British empire. He mourned a world that had become too, in his words, effeminate that suffered from, again, his words, immoderate greatness because it had adopted the manners and customs of outside barbarians. In other words, what he was doing with his mammoth tome was writing about Rome as a warning for his own London. And you can see some of the, uh, the quotations pulled from, from Gibbon on your, your screen there now. Elsewhere, the Yunkin standards move the rise of Islam, which is uh, learning um, outcome seven, from the ancient world to the medieval world. 
Now, this is this might seem like kind of an innocuous, perhaps inconsequential move, but it, it isn't, and it, I think it's it's very important for a number of reasons. Um, the reasoning I think that the Yunkin administration is using is actually, again, not at least it's not from the 18th century, but it's from the early 20th, because this seems to be manifesting the work of an, a former scholar by the name of Henri Perrin. Perrin was a, a Belgian scholar who wrote in the, in the early 1930s. You can see the cover of his first book called Muhammad and Charlemagne, which was published in 1937 there on your screen. And he agreed basically with Gibbon that Rome fell, th that things got worse afterwards, whatever that means. But he pushed back the date. So uh, disagreeing with Gibbon that it happened in the fifth century and saying that it happened in the eighth and ninth century. And because he blamed Islam. He said that Rome fell when the Mediterranean world, which had existed kind of as a Roman lake, if you will, um, within the empire, was closed off by the conquests of Islam. In other words, what Peren is doing, what the Jungian standards are replicating here, is, is suggesting, in fact, kind of arguing that Europe in this thinking is only Christian. By placing Islam in the ancient world, the development of medieval and hence modern Europe is dependent upon Islam rather than saying, as the new standards do, the young standards do, that it's an aberrant strain that develops after Rome and that it's fundamentally separate and apart from this thing that we call Europe. Now, there's of course a lot to say about these moments and the threads that connect them. I bring them up primarily, however, to show how so much of what we quote unquote know about the European Middle Ages is shrouded in fog and in darkness. We're still here in the 21st century seduced by the historiography, the scholarship of previous generations, by the political, cultural, and religious concerns of the 19th and early 20th century. And those scholars who were often transparent in how they were writing about the past in order to provide moral lessons for their own world, that the past was in some way secondary to their modern, contemporary, in their cases, concerns. Jules Michelet, for example, one of the foundational historians of France, in the originator of the idea that there was widespread fear of the end of the world around the year 1000, the so-called terrors of the year 1000 thesis, is, for example, explicit in saying that his understanding of the medieval world came from his experience in the 1830 July Revolution in France. He writes this. The, uh, the 1830 Revolution, if you're unfamiliar, is a popular up, was a popular uprising in Paris when it upended the existing monarchy and ushered into its place a liberal constitutional monarchy. The Parisian bourgeoisie, who were the perpetrators of the rebellion, were kind of heady with these, these ideas of kind of liberty and um, kind of the ideals of the, the, the original French Revolution. But Michelet wrote in his preface to his, uh, his, his most famous book, The History of France, that, quote, the first pages I wrote after July, written on, oops, sorry, uh, written on the cobblestones, the hot cobblestones of Paris, were look at the world, a universal history, as a fight for freedom and its victory over fatal of a fatal world. In short, this was an eternal July. In other words, what Michelet seems to be doing is he's writing history teleologically, that there's an end point the July Revolution that all history is building for. And so he's going back into the past, looking for examples, in his case, the history of France, the medieval France, to find ways that we got to this particular place. This intentionality, which Michelet is again very uh, clear about, colored his work. Gibbon, Michelet, Perrin, and others were, were writing what historians have now called a practical past, which is history in service of the nation state. This kind of bias, any bias, of course, really doesn't mean we should cast off their conclusions. Everybody writes with bias, but it does mean we should stop ignoring it if, as if it weren't there. We're, we too often pretend, on, especially related to scholarship about the European Middle Ages, that it doesn't exist, that this, this bias doesn't exist, and, ask if, if, and act as if these conclusions that they're offering are value-neutral, quote-unquote, objective observations. The zombie myth of medieval Europe as the Dark Ages is built upon a foundation of assumptions that crumble when light is shown upon the period, when the sources, the actual sources, both primary from the period itself, but also secondary from succeeding centuries, are re-examined. I bring this all up simply as a way of showing how part of the issue with both studying and teaching the European Middle Ages is combating assumptions. When we say that the period begins with a quote-unquote fall of Rome, it presupposes a decline, a loss, 
when we say that the period ends with a renaissance, it presupposes that humanity has climbed out of a hole. The sun, in other words, shines on the peaks of either side of the period, but below, of course, is only darkness. Who knows, people think, what lurks down below in the valley, but whatever it is, of course, it sure ain't good. In other words, one of the problems with the Dark Ages is that people seem to know something about the period before they really know something about the period. The dark in the Dark Ages does so much work because it sim simultaneously tells us that we lack sources and so can't know anything about the period, but also that we can know something about the period because it was bad. It was filled with superstition and horror. We quote unquote know, for example, that they didn't bathe, that they thought the earth was flat, that they fought incessantly with other religions, etc., cetera, et cetera. But in reality, they bathed all the time. It was really only in the 17th and 18th century that people stopped bathing regularly, or Europeans, I should say, stopped bathing regularly. They knew the earth was round because they, they knew and read Ptolemy and they shared that information widely. And different religious traditions, of course, did fight with one another, but also traded with, allied with, and married into each other, um, in each, into each other's traditions at times as well. When we look at the sources, we see a Europe that wasn't closed off, actually, but was instead quite permeable to people and ideas. A Europe that had peoples of different colored skin mingling in their ports, celebrated in their sculpture, and a Europe that was not only part of the world, what, sorry, in a Europe that was not the only part of the world in which things were happening. So for the rest of my time, I'd like to talk about two things. First, I'd like to bring to light the origins of this idea of the Dark Ages, where it comes from, and some of the baggage that the term still carries with it today. And second, to try to dispel that, to move towards dispelling that, I should say, I'll talk about Iberia, modern Spain and Portugal in the uh, European Middle Ages, in order to highlight some of the complexity of the period, how medieval moments can be filled with both horror and hope, how specifically modern politics and religion sometimes stand between us and a truer version of the past, and how we have the sources to actually know something real about the past. But let me pause here for a moment and see if there's any questions. And I'd encourage you all to uh, present any questions that you have in the Q&A uh, tab in the Q&A box. I see you're all very active in the audience chat right now, and we appreciate that energy. Uh, again, if you should have any questions, feel free to present them to Dr. Gabriel, and I will bring them to the uh, forefront, and I'll bring them to his attention, um, you know, throughout his talk. So, uh, again, thank you all for being so active. Great. Yes, and please, please ask questions. Um, but while I'm waiting, I'll I'll just kind of continue and I'll talk more about the Dark Ages. So so let me talk about where the myth of the Dark Ages kind of comes from, because it's a myth that really dates back um, nearly seven centuries. Uh, some of the blame for uh, creating this myth can be laid at the so-called uh, the feet of the so-called Italian Renaissance. Um, in the 1370s, this guy, uh, the famous poet Petrarch, uh, claimed that the art of his immediately preceding generations was cloaked in his words, in darkness and dense gloom. The ancient past, he said, that of Greece and Rome was an era of, he called it, pure radiance. And antiquity was a, quote, more fortunate age. In the middle, in our time, you see the confluence of wretches in ignominy. Petrarch was, in other words, sketching out a schematic for periodization in history. He himself lived at the tail end of a middle age, one of darkness caught between the light of antiquity and that of a new age on the cusp of renewal, a renaissance, if you will. He was also a man of very large ego, but that's another story entirely. So anyway, this is the moment, almost literally, uh, with Petrarch in which the so-called Middle Ages were born. The only period of history with both an end and a beginning. Antiquity, of course, has an end, but no real beginning. It just kind of stretches off into the, uh, the distant past. And modernity has a beginning, but it stretches off into the unseen future. The Middle Ages are bounded. And it's bounded by, as Petrarch said, one of, by being contained, or sorry, um, it's, it's one that's bounded by having contained wretches in ignominy. One, uh, a period more in shadow than what came before and what came after. And this was an amazingly successful propaganda effort. 
and one we continue to be taken by at times to this day. As the historian John Arnold, who um, was part of the readings, among many others, has noted, Petrarch's implicit threefold division of time in history was taken up with vigor, especially in the early modern period. The 17th century Swedish professor who was working in Germany, uh, Christoph Solarius, for example, cemented this division into learned culture by writing a textbook and putting precise boundaries on the different periods. According to Solarius, um, antiquity lasted until the reign of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the early 4th century. Um, the Middle Age, which is uh, Latin for medium iwum, hence the English word uh, medieval, literally Middle Age, um, lasted until the fall of Constantinople by, to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 CE. And then modernity for Solarius and for us even today, of course, stretches off into the future. Um, I should note here that first, the schematic Solarius imparted remains relatively current in most classrooms to this day, both university and, um, you know, um, and otherwise. Second, the medieval period is still one of darkness in his view, just like Petrarch, because it lacked access to classical learning. And third, that the boundaries of the periods have to do with religious changes. Solarius's Middle Age began not having to do with art as with Petrarch, but when Constantine converted to Christianity, when classical learning, according to him, gave way to, quote unquote, his words, Catholic superstition. That Middle Age ended when, after the fall of Constantinople, Christian scholars fled west and brought with them more classical learning that sparked the so-called Renaissance in Europe. So note how religion plays in this framework. Christianity, according to Solarius, is corrupted, if you will, by association with Rome. Then the spell is broken with the fall of the new Rome. After the Reformation, um, which Solarius was, of course, writing afterwards as well, this was a favorite trope that reinforced the boundaries of antiquity, the Middle Age, and modernity. The medieval as a site of Roman Catholicism, by which especially Protestant historians meant superstition. True religion, meaning, of course, to them only Christianity, they don't even talk about other religions really, in antiquity was reform was for reformers like Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, and others rescued in their own times after they had broken from the, again, darkness and superstition that had corrupted the world and had immediately preceded them. Even as late as the 19th century, Jacob Burkhart, who wrote a famous book called The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, wrote, and this is on your, your screen now, in the Middle Ages, both sides of human consciousness, that which was turned within and that which was turned without, lay dreaming or half awake beneath a common veil. The veil was, warm, was woven of faith, illusion, and childish prepossession, through which the world and history were seen in, clad in strange hues. Man was conscious of himself only through some general category. In Italy, this veil first melted into air. An objective treatment and consideration of this world became possible. The subjective side at the same time asserted itself with corresponding emphasis. Man became a spiritual individual and recognized himself as such. The darkness of medieval Europe is because of, according to uh, Burkhart, this veil of superstition. Protestantism for him, modernity, was the force that finally melted that veil. That allowed reason and rationality to prevail. But the melting of the veil was also important for 19th and early 20th century scholars like Burkhart, because it, it allowed for the formation of their own nation states. In other words, the medieval was an important pass through a period because, according to them, it delinked them from a universal Rome and allowed polities to spread themselves out into places we call today France, Germany, Italy, England, etc. But in addition, and perhaps paradoxically, the creation of a middle age that was done gave these historians something to evolve from. This dark age of origins, if you will, made them feel better about themselves, something that they could look backwards towards but have moved beyond. This is a manifestation of a contemporary Hegelian dialectic from you know, uh, the thinker Hegel, a good thing of antiquity, the thesis, the bad thing of the medieval world, the the antithesis synthesizes into an even better thing, which is their own modernity. Again, no shortage of ego on these guys, but again, that's another story. Uh, the thread that connects these moments, of course, is some sort of renewal. The idea that there is some sort of renewal. 
a certainty in their writings that the world somehow got worse for a time and it's better now, this middle age, this dark age. As such, the preceding bad time became for them a twisted mirror of their own time. Petrarch thought his art and letters were good, therefore the preceding times were unrealistic and stylistically naive. Protestants thought their religion rational, therefore the preceding times was superstitious. Historians at the dawn of the modern university in the 19th century thought their own industrialized nation filled with a certain type of learning and hygiene were good, therefore the preceding times the world was rural, backwards, and dirty. The opposite. In other words, the darkness of the Dark Ages often has very little to do with the period itself. Instead, the particular darkness of the Dark Ages suggests emptiness, actually, a blank, almost limitless space into, into which we can place our modern preoccupations. The Dark Ages, and we see this all the time, even today, continue to be, depending on their audience, both regressive and progressive, both a period of uh, time to abhor and one to emulate. The myth is trotted out whenever one wants, both as a justification and an explanation for ideas and actions, because they supposedly go, go so far back in time, but also because they allow us to distance ourselves from what we can't bear to see in our own world, to impose at least some distance between then and now. Those previous centuries of writing on medieval Europe saw, that saw no sources, only a veil dimly let past, supposedly, were in other words created by elite white men were going on safari into the past, hunting for themselves. It's no surprise they succeeded. They were looking for themselves, they found themselves. But darkness ultimately is dispelled by light. Again, not intending simply to swing the pendulum back the other way, to say that everything was great in the European Middle Ages. It absolutely was not, not even close. But rather, we need to listen more closely to our sources to expand our vision and try to see things from a different perspective. And so let me pause here again and see if there's any questions. Yeah, we have a couple of questions which have come in and uh, Lisa has a question. And her question is, is, does some of our thinking about the dark ages comes from just our modern approaches or so modern thinking? Um, how dark was it? That was one of the questions we received early on. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's a really important question because I think it has almost everything to do, uh, how we think about the Dark Ages has almost everything to do with how we're thinking about it today and very little to do with the period itself. And what I mean by that is that the original term, the Dark Ages, you know, comes from the idea that there are no sources. There were lots of sources in ancient Rome and ancient Greece. Then Rome, quote unquote, fell. There were very few sources there. It's, it's an impenetrable forest that we can't kind of, uh, the past becomes an impenetrable forest that we can't see into. And that's just not true. I mean, there's, there's lots of sources that survive. Sure, there are fewer than there were in, the, um, you know, in, in certain periods before then. There are fewer than there are um, in certain periods after that. But we do have sources and we can know things. Um, part of that is that we um, historians, especially how we're working um, more closely with uh, people in other disciplines, um, medieval studies is kind of a better term than medieval history in some ways, because we're, we're looking at um, different types of things than we used to in the past, archaeological sources, architectural sources, art historical sources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That stuff exists. It has existed for a long time. People have been talking about it. And so we can know something about the period. Um, but again, the bigger thing that that does and why I think the myth is so hard to shake really of uh, the Middle Ages as Dark Ages is because we can't know anything, we can just say whatever we want about it. And it becomes, again, kind of a bad thing or a good thing, kind of depending on your screen right now, for example, like you have some pieces in the Atlantic in which, um, you know, we're about to, the American Empire is just like Rome and we're about to fall and it's going to be terrible and awful. Or there's another piece in the Atlantic in which maybe that's good because medieval peasants didn't work a lot and they had a really happy lives. Like none of those things have a whole lot to do with the actual past. They're just kind of arguments about modern politics, um, you know, and so that's really what we're, we're, we're kind of fighting with right now. Good deal. Good deal. Thank you. And we have one more. And sure. uh, Wendy, Wendy says, admittedly, this is a, a somewhat basic question, but uh, our question is, is, are medieval, Middle Ages, and Dark Ages all referring to approximately the same years, just through different lenses? Yeah, no, that, that's actually not a basic question. That's an amazing question. Um, the reason for it, why it's an amazing question is um, 
<laughs> is A, if you put three medievalists in a room, you're going to get um, five different answers about when the Middle Ages are. Um, but the thing that complicates it even more is there are formal terms that different European nations use about different periods. The Dark Ages, for example, is a formal term that the, the, the British government uses for a particular period of English history. And it's different than uh, the Middle Ages or the medieval period or something like that. So in the United States, we kind of use them all interchangeably. Um, and I, I kind of lean towards that because I think there is kind of slippage um, uh, intellectually between the kind of concepts that they tend to represent. But you will see, for example, like in a, in a, a history book that's written by um, somebody who's um, you know, English or Scottish or something like that, or even a German book that's translated, like very narrow parameters, because that's the kind of understanding that they have. So that's even a, you know, another complicating factor that, um, you know, I, I'm not putting into, you know, my talk today, but is absolutely at play is that you have to try to figure out exactly what, what they're talking about, because they're, sometimes we're not talking about the exact same thing. Good deal. Thank you so much. That's, yeah, those are the questions we have for now. And again, I'll continue to monitor the Q&A box and I will let you know when they come in. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I'm going to move, well, you know, I'm going to move from kind of the, the abstract maybe to a little bit more um, a concrete because I'm going to start talking about um, Iberia now. Um, so, so yeah, so let me talk, talk about Iberia. Um, and Iberia, of course, is what we now call uh, Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. Um, it was the peninsula that became the Roman province of Hispania, and then for nearly a thousand years was a nexus of competing and cooperating uh, religions and cultures, varieties of Judaisms, Christianities, and Islams, all in the plural from the early 8th to the late 15th centuries. These competing and cooperating kingdoms and provinces and traditions might tempt us to think in blunt categories, to see this as a land of perpetual conflict, or perhaps one of a heady and aspirational tolerance where everybody just kind of got along. There's some reason for that, but, um, and there's some justification, I should say, um, for seeing that um, when we look at the sources. But the light we shine on this place in this time, I think reveals a much more interesting and much more complicated truth. Um, the thread that will follow as I kind of move through vignettes, as it, and we're going to kind of jump across centuries, but we're going to remain centered for the most part on the city of uh, Toledo, which is just south of modern Madrid, um, and focus on the living together and living apart the Muslims and Christians and Jews did in that city and in that area for around a thousand years. So Iberia has always had kind of an odd place in the European imagination. Um, it's, it's inside of and outside of, a part of Europe, if you will, and a part from Europe. Uh, this is both true about the European Middle Ages, how they've been studied in this area, but also how medievals themselves conceptualized their world. At first, um, uh, it was settled by, by Carthage, actually Rome's uh, rival. Uh, the peninsula was, but was observed, sorry, but then the peninsula was absorbed into Rome beginning in the late third century BCE. Um, Augustus only really completed the conquest for Rome um, of the peninsula about 200 years later, about 19 BCE. But it was Romanized quickly afterwards, organized into a new province, again called Hispania, with new cities founded, roads established, population integrated the empire, into the empire. The emperors Trajan, Hadrian, and much later Theodosius I, called the Great, as well as the 5th century empress uh, Galla Placidia, were all born on the peninsula um, in this province. Um, but Iberia suffered the same fate as the rest of the provinces in the 4th and 5th centuries. As the centralized authority of Rome, then Constantinople in the east, contracted, legions were pulled back from what was considered by them to be periphery into the core, forcing the Romanized locals, the Romans really, to fend for themselves, sometimes making uneasy alliances and accommodations with the Germanic peoples who had been moving across Europe throughout the 4th century and sometimes um, much before that, uh, the 4th century CE. In the case of Iberia, these groups were primarily called the Vandals and then the Goths. The Vandals, after rampaging into Italy in the beginning of the 5th century CE, were recruited into Hispania by local rulers for protection and settled there for a time before heading to North Africa about 20 years later. North Africa was a much richer, wealthier, uh, more prosperous province at this time than uh, Hispania was. 
Uh, but then those kingdoms were themselves conquered and subsumed by a united Visigothic, um, Visigoth meaning West Goths, kingdom during the late 5th and 6th centuries. And here you see a picture of the, the kingdom of the Visigoths. Uh, the Visigoths uh, were pushed and pulled southwards um, from their initial settlements were in Aquitaine, just north of the Pyrenees. Um, they established a kingdom that by the beginning of the 7th century spanned most of the Iberian Peninsula with uh, Toledo. And you can see that kind of right smack in the middle of the, the peninsula, not far again from modern Madrid as its capital. Although groups called the Basques and the Franks in the north and the Byzantines in the south at times uh, bumped up against Visigothic unity and succession crises, crises sorry, in the monarchy reared their heads from time to time, uh, the Visigoths ruled Iberia for nearly two centuries until about 711 CE when Arabs and Berbers arrived, conquered the peninsula and ended the Visigothic royal line. Now the traditional story about this transition of power goes something like this. The North Africans, like a wave, rolled northwards across the land and over the Pyrenees until the wave ran out of steam about 20 years later, not far from the city of Tours in what's now France. If they weren't stopped, um, oftentimes it's breathlessly reported, Europe would have been speaking Arabic for most of its history. And this is a reference to the 732 battle, or the Battle of Tours, sometimes called the Battle of Poitiers. This site was kind of between those two modern cities uh, that happened in 732. And this has held world historical significance in textbooks for some time, often portrayed as the battle that quote unquote saved Europe or saved Christendom. But, but as we might guess, very little of that characterization has to do with the battle itself. This was not, and I can't be clear about this, the beginnings or continuation of some sort of existential war between Christianity and Islam. The Christian Franks, who won the battle, defeated a raiding party, nothing more. The Franks' leader, a guy by the name of Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, great name, was a territorial lord who was looking to expand his power in Aquitaine, in what's now southern France. A rival of his had invited Arabs from Iberia to help against Charles, so the Franks traveled south, met those mercenaries, defeated them. The stakes of the battle, in other words, were about which Christian ruler controlled Aquitaine, a squabble between Christian lords with Muslim soldiers from Iberia recruited by and fighting for one Christian side against another. This fluidity can also be seen in how contemporary sources on both sides reacted in the wake of this Arab conquest in the early 8th century. Some sources suggest that, for example, in the decisive battle against the Visigothic king at Guadalete, the armies from North Africa were reinforced by Christian supporters of a rival claimant to the Visigothic crown. King Roderick of the Visigoths had staged a coup in 710, just before the, uh, the invasion, deposing and likely killing the previous king, a guy by the name of Wittitza. The Chronicle of 754, you see an excerpt of that on the left there. Uh, this was written in Latin, almost certainly by a Christian government offic governmental official, but who's working for the new Islamic rulers in Cordoba in the south of Spain. Uh, suggests that the Berber conquest of the kingdom was aided by the brother, or the stepbrother, it's a little bit unclear, of the deposed Witiza, um, the guy that King Roderick had just killed. It says that the Islamic ruler Musa, quote, you can see it there on your screen, on your screen uh, decapitated on a scaffold those noble lords who had remained, arresting them in their flight from Toledo with the help of King of Appa, King Ekeka's son. And Ekeka was Witiza's and Appa's father, so these guys were brothers. With Appa's support, he killed them all with the sword. A much later Arabic source, but one based on earlier texts called the Book of the Fragrant Garden, and that's right of your screen, was even more forceful in that first paragraph you can see there, relating that wit is a son and brother, both defected to the invading army in order to reclaim land stolen from them by King Roderick. Other Arabic sources, such as the narrative of Ibn Abd, um, Ibn Abd al hakam tell a very similar story. This model of warfare and cooperation would be replicated throughout the ninth century, but this time in reverse, with the Frankish Christian rulers, uh, Charlemagne and Louis the Pious, for example, invited south over the Pyrenees to intervene for and against various Christian and Islamic leaders. In other words, these, confl these conflicts at Guadalete in the south of Spain, Tour Poitiers, and even beyond into the ninth century, were Christians and Muslims fighting together and against one another at the same time. The vectors of division between the armies could be seen in contemporary terms as more political or ethnic than religious. 
we can perhaps begin to see now that the relationship between Muslims and Christians in Iberia, a place that was called Hispania under Rome, but for the next seven centuries was actually known as Al-Andalus, was always fraught, always complicated, always more messy than we might like to imagine. Adding to this mix, of course, was a substantial Jewish population, which had been present since Rome in the region and perhaps before, a group persecuted heavily by the Visigoths at time, but then remaining to find an uneasy abode under Islamic rule. These three peoples living with and next to one another on the Iberian Peninsula throughout the Middle Ages has long been known as a period of convivencia, literally meaning living together. But that history of convivencia has always been entangled with another term, reconquista, meaning reconquest. Medieval Iberia wavering, in other words, between imagined worlds, harmonious coexistence interrupted by religious fanaticism that led to violence on the one hand, supposedly convivencia, and on the other, religious persecution that was stopped only when Christians, quote unquote, reclaimed the land that was rightfully theirs, supposedly reconquista. But these are both, as we might guess, extreme positions. And the answer to dealing with extreme positions is to stick a pin down somewhere in the middle and call that the truth, because we need to understand where those extremities came from. And those ex the extremity of these types of historical analyses in Iberia become apparent when we look at where they came from. Both tra trace their origins, in fact, to a 20th century conflict, particularly to the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. The fascist side of the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, led by Franco, portrayed convivencia as medieval weakness by the Christians, who only tolerated others because they weren't strong enough to subjugate everyone else. In the fascist mind, their treason, the fascist treason against the democratically elected government of modern Spain, was similarly to the medieval past about fighting to retake their country once more, to make Spain great again, this time from Republicans, anarchists, and communists. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this propagandistic language remains prevalent to this day in more conservative circles in Spain, and perhaps rather naively in some mainstream scholarship in the rest of the world. Reconquista, for example, is still used in approving ways by the far right across the West and was a major platform item and reservoir of images for the far right Vox party in Spain during the 2019 election cycle. You can see some tweets there by Vox uh, leaders on the right hand side. In part, as a reaction to the right's medieval nostalgia, the left in Spain transformed the meaning of convivencia into a liberal value in the late 20th century. Its supposed multiculturalism that Christians, Jews, and Muslims live next to one another uh, was seen by them as a historical precedent for the uniqueness and strength of a modern liberal democratic Spain. The problem with these framings, both of them, is that they're both, both blunt categories having much more to do with modern politics than medieval practice. Succinctly put by Professor Hussein Fancy in uh, his book, Mercenary Med Mediterranean, he writes, quote, these 20th century debates about how to understand the relations of Jews, Muslims, and Christians in medieval Iberia were never methodological in nature, but rather moral. In other words, Fancy's saying, the debate about convivencia was a proxy war about secularization in modernity. Liberals are drawing direct lines, uh, liberals promoting convivencia are drawing direct, direct lines from the present into the past to downplay the significance of religion in organizing political groupings. Jews, Muslims, and Christians got along then, they can do so if we just put religion to the side today. Conservatives were doing the same thing, but to highlight and to lament the modern separation of religion and politics. Christians, in their words, Christians and Muslims knew they're, they're um, knew, knew to be separate. The Christians should be in charge then. Or the Christians were in charge then. The Christians should be in charge now. That's their argument. But again, these debates about the past are almost always actually about the present. So to dispel this myth um, of the Dark Ages as it impacts us here, we have to exercise these ghosts, exercise these ghosts of past historiography in order to get at the actual past. These are ghosts that linger on in the very terms we use and unseen limit how we understand that past. It should go without saying that medieval Iberia wasn't the same thing as modern Spain. Things were quite different in Hispania, in Al-Andalus, in the kingdoms of Navarre, Leon, Castile, Aragon, and later Portugal across nearly a millennium of time. When Visigothic soldiers helped the North African army defeat King Roderick in 711, 
or when the famous um, El Cid moved easily back and forth in the 11th and 12th centuries to fight for and against Christians and Muslims, or when in the 13th and 14th century Muslim Jeanettes from Granada joined the armies of the Christian kings of Aragon, or when Catalan Christian mercenaries traveled to North Africa to serve as the bodyguard for the Hafsid sultans. These are all complicate, are complacent, and all too modern categories of religion and politics and culture. They're neither eruptions through a static state of co amiable coexistence, nor are they deeply indicative of an unending hostility between different communities. So let's move ahead in time just a little bit, but return to Toledo, a city that once served, of course, as the capital of the United Visigothic Kingdom, but fell to the peoples of North Africa in 711 and then to King Alfonso VI of Leon and Castile in 1085 CE. After the fall of the Visigothic royal line, Toledo was at first simply part of the wider Umayyad Caliphate, which was ruling from Damascus. But when the Umayyads were massacred and overthrown by the Abbasids and the capital of the Caliphate moved to Baghdad in the middle of the 8th century, Al-Andalus resisted and separated itself. When centralized power in Al-Andalus began to break down during the 11th century, Toledo became a fully independent taifa, which is Arabic for sect or band, but basically kind of means kingdom. Across these three centuries, amid the, amidst the internal pol political struggles of Al-Andalus, Toledo began to look north rather than south, managing to play one side against another, Christians against Muslims. Especially during the 11th century, under the rule of Al-Mamun, Toledo leveraged its place in the middle, literally in the middle, becoming rich and powerful, becoming a haven for cultural and political exiles, and oftentimes appealing to their Christian neighbors for military aid against other Islamic taifas. This is the context into which Alfonso VI found himself when he took the throne in 1065. Upon his father's death, Alfonso inherited the kingdom of Leon, while his brothers divided between them the separate kingdoms of Galicia and Castile. Perhaps predictably, brothers often don't get along, civil war between them ensued. Alfonso lost and fled to the safety of the Taifa of Toledo, only returning after his brother Sancho II's death in 1072, at which time Alfonso again returned north, seized and united the three kingdoms of Leon, Galicia, and Castile once more. But after doing so, he pushed south, having learned from his time in Toledo that the political situation there was unstable. The Arabian population was unhappy with their Islamic rulers, one of whom, who had throughout the 1070s, even appealed directly to Alfonso for help. By 1085, the ruler of Toledo, a guy by the name of Al-Qadir, had had enough. He wasn't able to pacify the local elites, and he was destabilized by external pressures, some of which from Alfonso. And so he, con he contacted Alfonso and simply handed the city and its surrounding territory over to the king in exchange for promises of future support for Al-Qadir elsewhere to the southeast. The Islamic elites in control of the city opened the gates and welcomed Alfonso in. This is Christian reconquest, with a question mark after it. In the immediate aftermath of the Christians' arrival, not much really changed. Synagogues and mosques would not, Alfonso promised, be converted into churches in each community. Muslims, Jews, and uh, Latin Rite Christians were granted the right to be governed by their own legal codes. But it didn't last. The Jewish population remained fairly stable and secured for a time. The Mozarabic Christians in the city, a community that had lived in Toledo since the Visigoths, but had acculturated to Arabic civilization, they were still Christians, but they spoke and um, wrote in Arabic, were outside of this conversation. And although some stayed a few converted, most of the wealth, wealthy Muslim inhabitants fled south. And by 1087, the city's uh, primary mosque had become its new cathedral. Traditionally, most of the blame, or the praise in some quarters, I guess, for this hardening of attitudes against non-Christians was laid not at Alfonso's feet, but at his queen's feet, um, a woman by the name of Constance, as well as her confessor, a guy by the name of Bernard, who had been a monk at the great uh, monastery of Cluny in France, and then was later ar appointed Archbishop of Toledo. Constance was a daughter of the Duke of Burgundy, niece of the Abbot of Cluny, and directly descended from the Capetian kings of uh, France at the time. 
laying the feet, laying the blame for this, uh, this these changes between 20, 1085 and 1087 at the feet of these two wades into an either or framing of Convivente and Reconquista, though, blaming outsiders for fermenting um, interreligious conflict. Now, that's perhaps fair to a degree, but the suggestion that outside agitators are to blame for eruptions in civic life are almost always politically motivated, and that's no different here. By casting a light on the period itself, re recognizing before we get to the sources how modern preconceptions can cloud our view, we see that in this case, both Constant and Bernard were actually not really outsiders. They had been deeply embedded in Lyon and with Alfonso for several years, and something else is at work. Indeed, often forgotten in discussion of these events is the fact that when Bernard was raised to the bishopric, that when this new cathedral was created, he displaced somebody who was already in that see. Toledo had, as I briefly mentioned just a minute ago, had maintained a substantial Christian population continuously since the 8th century. There were many Christians who simply remained after the, uh, the conquest complete with a church hierarchy and practicing the exact same liturgy in many of the same churches they've been using since the 8th century. These native Christians, which again known as Mozarabic Christians, were not particularly pleased by Alfonso's takeover, since to them, the Leonese, their fellow Christians, who arrived in the city in 1085, were the interlopers. They were the outsiders, bringing with them different cultural practices, different hierarchies of power, a different language of worship, Latin, and a different practice of worship, um, a liturgy, uh, um, a performance of mass that was linked directly to Rome. So the appointment of Bernard as bishop in 1085 has to be understood alongside the conversion of the mosque into a cathedral, because both are aimed as much, if not more, at the native Christians of the city as the Muslims. Taken together, these two actions removed the leader of the indigenous Christian community and also relocated their sacred space. The moves taken together cemented Alfonso's control over his new capital by allowing the king to install his own people in positions critical to the governance of the city and by in literally physically marginalizing the city's native Christian, uh, the native Christians at the periphery of the city. The, the mosque is right smack in the middle. You can see the modern, the cathedral and the, uh, in the, early modern image uh, there as well. The older cathedral was way on the outskirts. So at the, at the same time, what this move did for, uh, for Alfonso is it created a chain of intellectual associations linking Toledo intellectually and materially northwards at Via, Bernard, his new uh, bishop, and their new cathedral, past the Pyrenees to Cluny and through them back south over the Alps to Rome and papacy. This is a messy relationship of communities living together just in this one particular moment and one spelled out within a very clear hierarchy. And indeed, for the, at least the next century, Toledo became a nexus, one of the major, if not, ma if not the major, points of intersection between religious communities, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish. But again, we should note a meeting point from, um, from where, um, sorry, a meeting point where it's terribly clear from whence power flowed and from whence it would never flow. But we're not quite done with Toledo yet, so let me pause here and see if there's any other questions? Okay, good deal. And we have about maybe 30 more minutes left. Um, and we have two questions. The first comes from Scott Moore. Hi, Scott. Uh, as an educator, it's easy to fall into the trap of teaching the negative aspects of this time period. And I wanted to know if there were some positive themes or sources we could counter the usual narrative with. Sure. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that that I think is really great to do is that if you're teaching, like one of the things that students know a lot about, regardless of kind of level, is is the are the Crusades, and there's lots of sources that have been translated into English, primary sources um, related to the Crusades. A lot of them have to do with conquest, but a lot of them don't. Uh, there's, for example, a really wonderful um, uh, book uh, called the uh, the Book of Com uh, Book of Contemplation. Uh, by Usama ibn Munkid, which is available on Penguin, and you know there's there's excerpts available online and stuff like that, um, which basically talks about kind of the the really weird, uneasy relationship that Muslims and Christians had in uh, during this period called the Crusades, in which they have each other over for dinner, they trade, like they go hunting together, they they have their kids educated together, and then like the next day they'll go out and fight each other. So it's a really weird, interesting. Um, uh, text that gets at kind of some of the complicated, interesting, messy um, relationships. The other thing um, that I like to, to talk about with 
with um, with students, uh, especially is is the art of the period, is the glorious stained glass of the cathedrals, um, the the manuscript images that were um, that were created in this period. Like there's so many of that. Um, the way that um, archives are putting manuscripts online now make that stuff really readily available and very easy to access. Good deal. And the next one is from Don. Um, Don has a great question. Thank you for that, Don. Uh, the question is, is while it's pretty well documented that much of the mathematics used by Copernicus in his own revolutions originated with Muslim scholars, does the bright spots in the dark ages of Catholic Europe, such as the rationalism of Aquinas and Summa Theologica, or Bacon's induction or others, potentially have roots in Andal Al Andalus or other nine Christian civilizations? I'm going to answer that in about five minutes. So I'm going to pause on that. So <laughs> Good deal. I'm going to get it very quickly. That's, a, that's an amazing segue. So, so maybe I'll press ahead if that's okay because we're going to get there. Okay. Good All right. Good deal. No problem. Yeah, those were the two questions that we had and again if any others come up I will let you know. Excellent. Well, we're right. we're we're heading towards a conclusion so we'll have some time for for more questions at the end. Right. Very very good. I'm I'm glad Don ushered in a nice little segue point for us. There. I know. Don, I'll get you your money later. So. <laughs> okay. Good deal. All right. So back to it. Um, so let me move forward a little bit, uh, just a few generations uh, from uh, Alfonso VI to the 1140s, so about 60 years later. And we're back to this, uh, this monastery of Cluny. The power, in, in the 1140s, uh, the powerful abbot of the monastery of Cluny, this guy by the name of Peter the Venerable, you can see him here, uh, visited Toledo himself. He traveled there himself. Um, he had journeyed south because he wanted to translate the Quran into Latin. And the city was a translation hub at the time, with workshops filled with native Christians who spoke Arabic, as well as Latin, northerners who had come south but spoke Latin but came to learn Arabic, Muslims who knew both, uh, Jews who knew both languages as well as Hebrew. Uh, Roger of Ketton, uh, the, the man who Peter eventually found, for example, was originally from England and had come to Toledo to do math, specifically to read treatises on algebra by Al-Khwarizmi and Arabic translations of the work of Aristotle. Indeed, Roger seems to have approached the project as he would of any of his other mathematical texts, having confronted the problem that all translators, of course, even to today make, which is uh, deciding to forego a literal translation and focusing on what he thought was the sense of the work. And to do this, he didn't do it himself. He worked in a group, almost certainly composed of Mozarabic Christians, again, native Christians, Muslims, and Jews, but all descendants of those who remained in the city after 1085. And indeed, when Peter returned home just a few years later, he, when he crossed the Pyrenees, this time he did so with the first Latin translation of the Quran. But why did he want this translation? The answer is really pretty clear because Peter is very clear. Peter lived only one generation past the conquest of Jerusalem um, in the First Crusade in 1099. And the monks of Cluny, and Peter specifically, were avid supporters of the Christian holy war. Ultimately, Peter wanted the Quran to learn better the errors of Islam, by his estimation, so that he could encourage more Christians to fight it with words, ink, and swords. But this translation, made in a, a workshop of collaboration between Muslims, Christians, and Jews working together, was used as a weapon in the Holy War. It indeed became uh, the basis for polemics against Islam for the next century and more. But this is a really interesting instance of violence and coexistence together at the same time. And this is what convivencia maybe should be understood as in its real medieval context, as complicated and human, with people making choices, sometimes to understand and work with one another, other times to hate and harm. Where we see collaborative blossoms, we also find roots of ideological hatred, and we can't ignore either. Now, the story of an interreligious medieval Iberia seems to end really in 1492. In that year, Ferdinand and Isabella, the rulers who married and combined the kingdoms of Aragon, Navarre, Leon, Castile, Valencia, and uh, Majorca, eventually effectively creating Spain as we know it today, conquered the last surviving Islamic taifa of Granada in the far south on your map there on the screen. This was almost immediately followed by orders expelling all the Jews from Spain and the heavy-handed persecution of the remaining Muslims that led many of them, most of them, to flee into North Africa. 
It's also no coincidence that in the same year, the king and queen sponsored a modest expedition westward led by a Genoan captain named Christopher Columbus in order to find a new path to the Indies. They did so not only because they hoped for riches, however, from silks and spices, but, and they say so directly, but also to link up with a fabled and imaginary Christian kingdom of Prester John that was supposed to exist somewhere in the Indies. These two great powers together, Catholic Spain and Prester John, it was thought would finally be able to march to Jerusalem and retake the city from the Muslims before the last days. But let's not end there. Let's push on just a moment, just a little bit beyond there, past Columbus's journey, past Luther's 95 theses. We'll end our journey through medieval Iberia today in 1550 in Valladolid. You can see it's a, there's a little red arrow there it's in the north of, um, it's a small city, just about 250 kilometers northwest of Toledo, still in the kingdom of Castile. But it was home to one of the oldest universities in Europe, founded in the early 1240s. And in 1550, a great crowd gathered at the cathedral to hear debate about what it meant to be human. The topic at hand was more specifically what, not who, the natives of the so-called New World for these Spaniards were, and by extension, what rights the monarchs of Spain and their colonizing landowners had over them. The atrocities Columbus and his crew committed against the natives of the Caribbean are, are well known now, but they in some ways seem to pale when placed next to what happened afterwards. The ravages of smallpox and other European diseases, Cortez's relentless warfare against the Aztecs in the early 1520s, leading to the destruction of that empire, Pizarro's perhaps even more brutal destruction of the Incas in the next decade. Jesuits, Franciscans, and Dominicans assisted these conquests, but at times also pushed back against them. So the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, King of Germany, King of Italy, King of Spain, Archduke of Austria, Duke of Burgundy, and Lord of the Netherlands, let me be clear, that's all one guy, asked the learned men for guidance for how he should alter his colonial policies. On the side of the landowners was a noted humanist, Juan Guinness de Sepulveda, a devoted follower of the new learning that had, by its own account, broken from darkness and brought back the light of antiquity. Greek learning, particularly Aristotle, was his guide. On the other side was a Dominican, a religious order that dated back more than 300 years to a time of Inquisition and Crusade. This was Bartolomeo de las Casas, himself a former landowner in the New World, but converted to a religious life who had renounced that life, the previous lifestyle and stepped in and became steeped in the best medieval, if you will, ecclesiastical church learning available. He was guided by thinkers from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages. So we have here a debate in which a medieval faced off against the modern with the nature of humanity on the line. Sepulveda argued that Spanish power had an almost unlimited scope in the Americas because following Aristotle, the natives were subhuman, literally barbarians who didn't know civilization. The natives' inferior rational abilities, according to him, according to Aristotle, manifested most explicitly in their paganism and provided a justification for wars of conquest, pacification, and ultimately conversion. And it's important to note here that in the 16th century, the claim that a group was barbarian was a formal intellectual one based on categories developed by Aristotle in his book, The Politics. In that book, Aristotle argued that people of his words, inferior capabilities were natural slaves who needed to be led by those of superior virtue and learning. Sepulveda follows the Greek, ancient Greek thinker then in saying that Aristotelian natural law dictated that the Spanish should be in charge of the natives' lives and futures. Indeed, Sepulveda concluded, it'd be immoral and sinful for the king of Spain to, al king of Spain to allow the natives to continue. De Las Casas, however, thought all of this brutal, unjustified, and illegal. He says that Sepulveda offers nothing more than honey-coated poison, and it's up to the wisdom of the king to stop its spread. So Las Casas concedes that the indigenous peoples of the Americas were polytheistic, but their being non-Christian made them no different than Muslims and Jews in Europe, and therefore entitled to the same right to live peacefully as any other. Both the Christian church and Spanish crown had a long history of accommodation, of convivencia, he says, that allowed for coexistence, no matter how uneasy. Indeed, the papacy and church hierarchy, Las Casas argued, had only questionable authority over those who hadn't converted. This authority would only really activate if conversion were to happen. And I should note that the Las Casas did support conversion. But that conversion could only come peacefully, though. 
those converted by force or conquered by arms would be under no obligation to retain their new religion. And in fact, those who converted them, the Spanish, would doom their own souls by acting against God's will. The debate itself, held before a council of theologians and representatives of the king, technically finished without resolution. No formal judgment was offered in the immediate aftermath. In the short term, someone might think that Lido Las Casas had won. In the following years, the Spanish crown expanded their direct oversight of the landowners and took responsibility for the natives' welfare, limiting, but and certainly not all, of the abuses suffered. But longer term, it seems that Sepulveda should be judged the ultimate victor. The friars' role in advocating for the natives was slowly quashed, and the landowners expanded their power at the expense of the indigenous population. But more importantly, maybe, moving forward in the 16th century, Aristotle's definition of barbarism overtook Europe. We see it deployed constantly in our sources to justify violence. Used by European colonizers in the Americas, Asia, and Africa, we even see the same language, the same arguments made by Sepulveda, used by Catholics and Protestants alike to justify killing each other in the European wars of religion in the 16th and 17th century. As such, the outcome of the debate may well conform to what we expect about pre-modernity, intolerance, religious violence, colonial power, the Dark Ages. This is all true. Yet, if we push a bit further and think a bit more about the debate itself, we may find that the, that myth blinds us to what's really going on. Because we should note that the two men here are arguing against one another, but also in some ways past each other. What I mean is that Sepulveda is primarily making a secular political argument about the role of our king, and by extension his subjects. And doing so by relying upon a certain type of ancient authority, Aristotle. On the other side, Las Casas is making a theological argument. He's suggesting Sepulveda is a kind of false prophet sent by the devil to lead Christians astray, evoking uh, for the king the words of Proverbs uh, chapter 5, for example, um, the honey-coated poison thing. Um, the stakes for Las Casas are, as with Sepulveda, about right rulership, but for Las Casas, it's more importantly about salvation. This was, in other words, um, to be clear, a debate at its core about medieval versus modern about religion versus secular, secularism. But the one arguing for peace for religious tolerance was the medieval religious. The modern secularist was arguing for colonization, violence, and oppression. Sepulveda was the one arguing using the bright lights of antiquity, using Aristotle and natural law for something very recognizable in modernity, for the power of the centralizing state and progress. Las Casas, though he didn't know it at the time, was arguing for a lost world of Christendom, using a tradition of theology that goes back all the way to the 4th century to pursue peace, to argue against war, and to show a history of tolerance. His argument was a snapshot of a million possible worlds that emerged from the European Middle Ages, visions of the future that could have challenged the colonial project as a whole, even if it ultimately failed. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that throughout this debate, both participants and audiences were aware of their long genealogies. Both stood, as they argued in the 16th century, in a tradition of scholarship that uh, stretched back through the heyday of the medieval universities to the 14th century, past the revival of the schools in the 12th, through the court school of Charlemagne in the 8th and 9th, and into the transformation of the Mediterranean world in the 4th and 5th. But all that complexity of the medieval world, all its possibilities, all its horrors, all its hopes, began to collapse in upon itself at that debate. And it did so in a church in front of theologians on behalf of a Holy Roman Emperor, as they debated a world that just 60 years before had been, their, had been beyond their imagination. Even as I've been talking about Europe, I hope it's noticeable that none of this is simply Europe. If you read the documents of the 1550 debate, which I provided some of them, you quickly see that one of the most cited authorities is not just Aristotle, it's Thomas Aquinas. Originally from Southern Italy, he joined the Dominicans and studied at the University of Paris, writing prodigiously in order to reconcile the works of Aristotle with the currents of contemporary Christian thought before dying in 1274. But this was only possible because of choices made by people like Alfonso VI in the translation studios of Toledo in the 1080s. One of the most famous translators in Toledo was Michael Scott, who was active in the 1220s and partnered with a Jewish scholar named Abuteus Levitasso. Michael was, in fact, so prolific a translator that he was swept up from Spain to Palermo in Sicily, where he joined the court of the Emperor Frederick II. 
Frederick wanted Michael because he was so skilled a translator that those around him thought he may have been a sorcerer using the dark arts to move between languages. And most of Michael's work was dedicated to translating into Latin from the Arabic, the words of Ibn Rushd, also known as Averroes. Ibn Rushd was born in Cordoba in Al-Andalus in 1126. His primary work was a series of commentaries on Aristotle, but with the intention of reconciling the monotheistic God of Islam with that of Greek philosophy. Outside of the exceptional influence he had in, uh, in the tradition in the Islamic world, within a generation of Ibn Rushd's deaths, students at the University of Paris were so enamored of his work that the church administration was worried the school had been taken over by Averroists, they called them. This is, in other words, the University of Paris that Thomas Aquinas attended. His own massive foundational Summa Theologia, a summation of theology, impossible without the new Aristotle, but more importantly, impossible without the work of Aristotle's commentators, Ibn Rushd, as well as we should note the works of the Jewish Muslim thinker Maimonides. But the papacy and king of France weren't happy with all this Aristotle and Averroes being taught at university with what they saw as the infiltration of pagan learning into Christian discourse. Governmental authorities seeking to silence free inquiry in universities has an unfortunate long history. So in 1277, the Bishop of Paris was asked by the king to investigate the university. He returned 219 propositions as unorthodox, hence no longer to be taught. The works of Aristotle, Ibn Rushd, and even Aquinas himself were banned. A ban only partially lifted 50 years later when Aquinas was made a saint in 1323. This is, of course, both a very different Aristotle to the one that animated the debate between Sepulveda and de las Casas, but it's still recognizable. The long lines that move through the past, lines that we can see, we can know, emerge oftentimes unexpectedly later to haunt the halls of a different medieval university, but this time several centuries later. Here we look at the sources. We touch the stone at Notre Dame, we smell the vellum, and in so doing, we see a very knowable medieval Europe. Ideas, Aristotle, moved to the Mediterranean, arriving in Alexander, Alexandria to be translated into Arabic, then to Baghdad, and then to the, to the Straits of Gibraltar and Ibn Rushd in Cordoba, who died in Marrakesh in modern Morocco, but at the same time staying in Egypt with Maimonides, both traditions converging on Toledo and the Kingdom of Castile to be translated by a Scotsman who studied at Oxford, Paris, and Bologna before going to Iberia, and then transported from there back to Paris, where Christian, Muslim, and Jewish thinking found a hungry audience at a bustling university. But some were threatened by this intellectual living together, about the perceived softening of boundaries between religious traditions, and so worked to reharden them. The motivations behind this exchange and movement of ideas matter, and often enough medieval people learned about the other only to refute them. In telling new stories about the European Middle Ages, or better on medieval Europe, a medieval world that was never simply Europe, but also North Africa, the Near and Middle East, sometimes Ethiopia, and sometimes China, a world that was permeable, we have to tell the whole story. Even just this small slice of the past I've offered here today is not a simple one. This is no dark age. It's eminently knowable and is indeed known. To tell one side of it is to erase what really happened, what might have happened been otherwise. The intellectual conversation between these three, three traditions in the 12th century only happened because of a peculiar set of circumstances around Toledo, and the ultimately failed attempt to crush that collaboration only happened because of a peculiar set of circumstances around Paris. Anyone who effaces that complexity, that messiness when they tell that story after the fact is selling something. And that's what the myth of the Dark Ages ultimately tries to do. The Dark Ages try to offer an answer before we even know what question we're answering. We're asking. It seems to offer an easy path back into the past. It gives modernity a scapegoat. scapegoat. Its supposed unknowability becomes a blank space upon which we can press all of our fears, all of what troubles us but it's always defined in the negative. To return here at the end to where I started, the proposed Yunkin standards for ninth grade history in Virginia only mention Iberia once, asking students, as it says right there, to describe, quote, the history of the decline of the Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula that culminated in the Reconquista and the rise of the Spanish and Portuguese kingdoms. We should, I hope, now notice the problems with this framing. Islam exists here only to be on the decline. Iberia exists here only to be rightfully reclaimed by the Christians. 
but we can tell a better history of these events by looking at the vast number of sources we do have, ones that show us possible worlds, that tell the truth about the past, that don't by any measure ignore the violence and atrocities that were committed, but also show moments of complexity, moments in which real breathing people lived in the past and made choices that had consequences. As we try to dispel those shadows that seem to obscure the past, we begin to dissipate those tricks of the light that lead us into thinking, thinking we see things that aren't there. Or to put it another way, maybe one less obscured by flowery metaphor, the challenge of academic rigor in history is taking your subjects seriously, treating them like people instead of like cardboard cutouts. We need to listen to our sources and acknowledge that things could have turned out differently. It's always our job to say it's more complicated than that. To speak about medieval Europe as a period that wasn't simple, white, hegemonic, patriarchal space, therefore isn't revisionist, it isn't political, it's a, it's a way to speak about the past that is real and is, that is true. The real Middle Ages was permeable, it was diverse, it was intelligent, and it sought peace. But it was also one that cared deeply about separating peoples, it was insular and xenophobic, it quashed inquiry, it committed horrific violence. In other words, the real Middle Ages are not so different from our own. It was populated by human beings. We move away from the dark ages by casting better light on the period, by listening as best we can to the people who actually lived there in order to see a rich and fully human period of human history. We can and do know a lot about this period in this place, benefiting from decades of recent scholarship, new sources that have just as importantly begun to peel back the historiographical assumptions about the medieval that have for so long obscured our view. Casting light on the supposed dark ages simply allow us to see better, both beauty and horror. The light that illuminates this past might be sparkling on the floor, filtered through a thousand colors of a rose window in a cathedral, but it also might be a fire that burned books or even people, fires lit by people with hate in their hearts. To ignore one of them in favor of the other does a disservice not only to those we study, but to us as well. Thank you very much for your time. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Gabriel. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question, and we have maybe about eight more minutes if anyone else would like to ask any questions. But uh, Felicia has a very honest and practical question that comes up for most teachers. And she says that I, I find it hard to teach religion to the students because what they learn from the parents is different mm -hmm. from what is in the text. How do you handle this with your students? And then there's one more after that. Yeah, no, an, an amazingly important question. Um, one of the things that I have um, the benefit of, or we have the benefit of, and when we talk about the Middle Ages, is that because the period is so long ago, if I found it very effective that if I just preface it by saying that, that listen, these we're just we're just we're dealing with the sources. We're listening to what these people said. If that impacts your own particular kind of faith journey, that's fine. But that's not the purpose of this, because oftentimes we'll get I'll get people who um, you know respond when I ask a question about like, well, you know, what did what do they mean by this, or what are they why are they doing this? Then they'll respond with something that they've clearly learned from their family or from you know a pastor or something like that or whatever religious tradition they're brought up in. And then I can always point to the source and say like, okay. That's great, but does where does it say that in the source? And then they can't find it, and they have to grapple with you know what the the, the kind of weirdness and unfamiliarity of the uh, the text itself, and that seems to allow them the distance to to ask questions, if you will, kind of there in that space, kind of away from themselves, than here where they're they have to really wrestle with things. And if they end up dealing with things themselves in the here and now, that's great, but that's not the point. And I try to emphasize that. Good deal. Thank you. And there's one more from Felicia. Her question is, is, do you think Africans have a bigger part of the Dark Ages, the history of the Dark Ages, than a lot of the uh, research tells us? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the one of the more interesting, there's a really amazing book, um, which was just translated into English uh, by a French historian. Um, it's called The Golden Rhinoceros. And it's kind of a, a a tour through objects, if you will, like like archaeological objects of the African Middle Ages, what he calls the African Middle Ages. It's an amazing book um, that really shows how vibrant and how, again, like knowable this period is in um, um, uh, on the African continent. 
it also shows, and I think this is really important because it's not defining Africa as only a subset of medieval Europe, but as a thing in its own right that didn't really care in a lot of ways about what was going on in Europe because they had much more interesting things that they themselves, that the, the communities there were dealing with and were, uh, were producing and the texts and the, the objects and things like that. So, so yeah, absolutely. There's much more, there's much more conversation that needs to be, um, need to be had there. The other thing too, that oftentimes medieval surveys do um, both books and, and classrooms is they ignore North Africa. But people knew about North Africa throughout the European Middle Ages. They traveled there. That was the rich part of the world for them, and a part that was really sorely missed um, once the um, you know trade seemed to started to decline slowly in the seventh and eighth centuries. So people were aware, were aware of that, but also people moved and they traveled in different ways. And so the integration, the permeability, as I tried to emphasize, of the Mediterranean was really important. Very good. Very good. And. We have a statement uh, as well, and uh, a few other comments that are in the audience chat, if you'd like to take a look at them. But uh, everyone is just so thankful and appreciative of your of your time. Uh, John Terry, uh, he chimes in on the golden rhinoceros as a really good for teaching. Um, and so many thanks to uh, so many teachers are saying they would definitely use the primary sources of the conquest. Uh, Sanina and uh, several others. And again, we just appreciate your time. Uh, there were uh, comments on the cathedral in the last slide that you had up there, slide 53, just about how gorgeous that cathedral is. So, um, but I believe that is so much. Uh, I think that's uh, that's our time. And um, again, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, uh, please feel free to put more comments in the audience chat. We will have a few minutes before we close everything out. But again, thank you, Dr. Gabriel, for joining us and leading us as well as sharing your expertise with us all. We truly enjoyed this experience. I'd encourage everyone who is here to keep up with what's happening at the National Humanities Center uh, via our various social media feeds, um, as well as direct emails to get updates on our activities. I'd also invite you to check out our next webinar, which is scheduled for December the 8th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time with lead scholar Manisha Senya of the University of Connecticut entitled The Abolitionist Roots of Reconstruction. I would encourage you all to share this information with your coworkers and others in your network uh, as well. And uh, one additional comment to Felicia, who was asking the question uh, about Africa, I'd invite you to check out our Medieval Africa and Africans course as well. Um, uh, if you'd like to register, just reach out to me directly and mention that, uh, mention this webinar as well. But again, thank you all uh, for joining us and we hope to see you again during our Humanities in Class webinar series during our next session. Have a great week. <laughs>